one of the most infamous prisons in the world, a symbol of a dark war waged by the United States. Tout est fait pour les rendre des bêtes féroces. Built to hold the worst of the worst of U.S. enemies after terror struck America. Vice President Cheney said clearly he would do anything to prevent another attack. Anything. It was a quest for justice based on human rights violations and torture conducted in someone else's country. For many, Guantanamo represents everything that is wrong with U.S. foreign policy, and it looks like it is here to stay. And we're going to load it up with some bad dudes, believe me, we're going to load it up. We traveled to Gitmo 15 years after the detention facility opened to find out whether it has done more to help or hinder America's fight against terrorism. Tonight we are a country awakened to danger and called to defend freedom. Our grief has turned to anger and anger to resolution. Whether we bring our enemies to justice or bring justice to our enemies, justice will be done. President George W. Bush's orders were simple, find them. And this is where they were brought to. At its peak, Guantanamo held nearly 700 people. Nizar Sassi was number 325. Before that, he had been living in a suburb of the French city of Lyon, where he says a friend suggested a bit of adventure. He was 21, unemployed, and liked guns. But he says he never heard of Al-Qaeda until he got to Afghanistan. And it was Ben Laden. C'est un camp qui préparait des, euh, des jeunes à, à, à la guerre. Ce n'était pas forcément au terrorisme, mais à la guerre. Au pire des mondes. Nous, on espérait qu'on voilà, puisse sortir tranquillement et rejoindre, retourner chez nous et oublier un peu tout ça. Mais garder ça en tant qu'expérience. Qu mais euh, le, monde, le monde a été chamboulé par ces attentats. Donc ça, c'est des choses que personne ne maîtrise. Mais c'est vrai que toutes les portes se sont fermées. But then these doors opened, and Nizar ended up in Guantanamo in January 2002 as a prisoner of the so-called War on Terror. Dès qu'on est arrivé là-bas, j'ai une impression, mais en fait, c'était plus une impression, c'était une réalité après qu'on a découvert, c'est que il ne maîtrisait rien du tout. We negotiated for months to be allowed into the prison complex. The U.S. military agreed to take us on one of its carefully scripted and well choreographed media tours. And for two and a half days, soldiers showed us around Guantanamo Bay. Welcome to Camp 5. This is where non-compliant captives were locked up in isolation. The complex is now empty. But for how long? So we have 75 empty cells. Correct. That could host prisoners today. Uh, yes. There were strict rules on what could and could not be photographed. And soldiers frequently checked our footage and deleted pictures they said exposed sensitive information or violated the privacy of the prisoners. 41 men remain in detention in Guantanamo. 15 are considered high-value detainees and are kept in a secret location, including the so-called 9-11-5, the five men accused of plotting the terror attacks. We were taken to see the other 26 in the morning and during prayer time. It felt like we were spying and was by far the most uncomfortable moment of our time in Guantanamo. This is the closest we can get to the detainees. Behind this glass door, there is a communal area, a space where they get to spend time together, read together, have their meals together. We're not allowed in any way to let them notice us, and if they do discover we're here and try to communicate with us in any way, we're going to be asked to leave the facility and we'll get our material deleted. Some of these men were sent here when they were only children. 
the youngest detainee arrived at the age of 13. This year, the oldest will mark his 70th birthday. But apart from knowing their name and age, we're kept in the dark about what really happens to the prisoners. So our only direct link to their story is Nizar, who spent two and a half years inside Gitmo, during which he says he was beaten, humiliated, and sexually abused. And bizarrely, for me, the most the most cruel and the most difficult was the torture psychological. Parce que euh, la torture physique était dure, violente, humiliante, mais elle, elle s'arrêtait. C'est-à-dire le matin, dès que je me levais, j'étais content de pouvoir être sain d'esprit. Et mon objectif dans la journée, c'était d'arriver au soir et d'être toujours sain d'esprit. Donc c'était toujours ça mon objectif. Parce qu'autour de moi, je voyais des, des autres détenus qui étaient tout à fait normaux et qui, du jour au lendemain, Inside these cells, the United States is accused of having committed some of the worst human rights violations of its history, including waterboarding, a technique experts describe as a mocked execution. Uh, there are other techniques that they use, including, uh, they call them confinement boxes, which is placing someone in something the size of a coffin. Uh, uh, they, they, uh, a technique called walling, we would repeatedly throw someone into a wall. Nizar says the cruel treatment reserved for Guantanamo detainees went even further and makes allegations that the United States experimented with medicine. C'est-à-dire qu'ils venaient, ils nous amenaient toute tout une panel de, de médicaments et qu'ils nous disaient voilà, c'est pour telle, telle maladie. Bon, bon, c'est bidon quoi, ils ont essayé tout ce qu'il fallait, tout ce qu'il fallait. Et si vous refusiez, ils faisaient intervenir à la force et vous les, et vous les inoculez de force. Overseeing everything was Army Major General Jeffrey D. Miller. The intelligence that we develop in the, from this JTF is of enormous value. A distinguished service member praised as an innovator by the U.S. military. General Miller took what was initiated at Guantanamo and exported it to other locations. He came for a visit and an assessment and implementation of a plan already in place at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. His words were that he was going to gitmoize Abu Ghraib and he was going to make it the interrogation center for all of Iraq. But it went well beyond Iraq as the U.S. put together its extraordinary rendition program, capturing and holding suspected terrorists in secret black sites across the world. Meanwhile, a battle was going on in Washington. The CIA and George Tennant and Secretary Rumsfeld and the Pentagon, they each wanted to outdo one another, to be the savior of America, you know. Bye, 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 bye. Pressure. And so you got the CIA looking everywhere for interrogation techniques that would work, they thought. And you got the Pentagon trying to beat the CIA. The Bush administration's argument was that the end justified the means and that information extracted from these detainees would help the U.S. prevent new attacks. It was a theory later dismissed by a U.S. Senate investigation which called the strategy brutal and ineffective. There are very effective means to get someone to do what you want them to do. They're not a very effective means to get the truth. In 2009, President Barack Obama abolished the Enhanced Interrogation Technique program, and the President himself came to admit what the U.S. had done. In the immediate aftermath of 9-11, uh, we did some things that were wrong. We did a whole lot of things that were right, but we tortured some folks. Today, military personnel in Guantanamo insist this is a very different place. I, I've never heard that the DOD personnel here, the, uh, the Army, the Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guardmen, uh, they do things the right way. And um, those reports out there, uh, just as you say, I, I can't really speculate on them. What hasn't changed is the legal limbo this place represents for the men who have not been charged with any crime. For the advocacy network that represents some of them, the U.S. is not at all interested in putting most of these detainees on trial. 
It just wants to keep the detention facility open. And the Defense Department wants to preserve its prerogative to run a detention facility. And they see Guantanamo as the most viable detention facility for any future conflicts that they might be fighting. You know, if they end up sweeping into Somalia and detaining hundreds of prisoners who can't be charged with any legitimate war crime, but they don't want to release right away, um, uh, or maybe they want to, you know, hold them and interrogate them um, in case they capture new people or something like that, well, they want Guantanamo to be a place that's open and available to warehouse. So. And that place is conveniently close, less than 200 kilometers from the coast of Florida. Guantanamo is America's oldest offshore base. It's been here in Cuba for over 100 years. And the sleepy town of Caimanera has long lived under the shadow of the American presence here in Cuba. It lies just a few hundred meters away from the entrance of the base. Only those authorized by the Cuban Interior Ministry get past the three military checkpoints that control access to the village a village where many of the people wished the American base would just close. Con la maniobra que ellos hacían aquí cerca de la base, ahí en la base naval, se hacían unas maniobras que siempre el pueblo estaba asustado porque se sentían las bombas como si estuvieran cayendo aquí mismo. Yo he conversado con personas que están locos, bueno, de mi edad, que dicen, ay, ¿hasta cuándo? Ya, si eso nos pertenece, eso es de nosotros, que nos lo den. Many hoped that the recent normalization of ties between the U.S. and Cuba would eventually lead to the departure of the U.S. troops stationed here. But the construction of the detention facility inside the base has renewed Guantanamo's military importance and reduced the chances of the base ever shutting down. La presencia de una base militar en Guantanamo en contra de la voluntad de nuestro pueblo en territorio nuestro es como un puñal clavado en el alma del pueblo cubano. Hasta que no se vaya a la base, ese puñal seguirá sangrando. Back on the other side of the fence, the new U.S. president's plan to expand Guantanamo has yet to materialize. But the commander of the Joint Detention Group tells us the prison can accommodate more people. Uh, I mean, we have capacity for up to about 200 detainees, but that's a very um, fluid number, because that all depends upon uh, the category of the detainees that would be coming in, if there's male, female mixture, so there's a lot of different things that could come into play as to how many detainees we could actually uh, take in. Um, we would need, obviously, some time if we were given the notification uh, for detainees to come in. We'd have to have some preparation, obviously, to do on the ground, so I'm not set to take detainees in you know, tonight or anything like that. The future of the detention facility and its inmates is now up to President Donald Trump. We're going to load it up. And his language on U.S. detainment rules has marked a significant shift from the previous administration. Would I approve waterboarding? You bet your ass I'd approve it. You bet your ass. In a heartbeat. In a heartbeat. And I'd, I would approve more than that. And don't kid yourself, folks, it works, okay? It works. For those who have experienced Guantanamo, the detention facility is only making things worse. C'est une machine à créer de la haine mortelle vis-à-vis -vis des Américains en particulier et, de, et des, des Occidentaux en général. C'est-à-dire les personnes qui sont dedans. Tout est fait pour les rendre des bêtes féroces qui sortiront. Et la première chose qu'ils qu penseront, c'est à... Nizar says he didn't fall into that trap, but other former inmates did. Low-level foot soldiers turned into highly motivated enemies of the United States, a cycle that President Obama wanted to break, but that his successor dismisses and might end up perpetuating. Annelise Borges, TRT World.